This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. So we're here today to award Dr. Wolfgang Fischer Bossert of the Austrian Academy of Sciences the Archer M. Huntington Award of the American Numismatic Society. With this medal, we bestow our institution's highest honor which is given annually to a scholar in recognition of the academic excellence in the field of numismatics. In the course of his career, Dr. Fischer Bossert has demonstrated exceptional ability to handle difficult topics in the field of Greek numismatics. Trained as an archeologist, he looks at ancient history and culture through the lens of the objects and in order to provide a historical context, such objects, and in this case, coins, need to be described, categorized, and then, this is often something Wolfgang will say, if possible, put in a context. Attention to detail is a sine qua non in our field, and here Fischer Bossert is a master at handling big data without, however, using ever a database. <laughs> even more remarkable in that case. He illustrated his ambition when he chose to re-examine for his doctoral thesis the silver diagram coinage of Tarentum, completed at the University of Bonn in Germany in 1994. It was then published in 1999 by the Corridor in the prestigious, now unfortunately defunct, Amok series. On almost 500 pages, Fischer Bossert reassessed this massive coinage initially studied by Sir Arthur Evans in 1889. For a graduate student, and I encountered him as a curator in the British Museum, being slightly horrified by the request he had, this was a truly extraordinary undertaking, in which he then catalogued over 8,000 coins, and this is something I got a lot of the reviews, I didn't count them all, and those coins from the late archaic until the early Hellenistic period, all these coins were analyzed. And it is now one of the standard works of Greek coinage. More monographs of major dice studies followed, such as the Athenian Decadron in 2008, and then a revised study of today's study of the Tetradromes of Syracuse of the Sign Artists in 2017. Again, a, a really major contribution. Other works included his catalog of some 300 Sumerian coins of the Abraham and Marian Sophia collection, where he had to really re-establish or establish a new typology for this somehow still mysterious coinage. Much of Fischer Bossert's research is based on careful observations of numismatic or other evidence, which has led him to consider a number of diverse, often fascinating topics. Many of his articles are crucial contributions in our field, dealing with art historical questions, for example, of imitations, Egypt, Sicily, and elsewhere, or a variety of technical topics, um, it is an extremely wide field of inquiry. In the last decade, we are fortunate, and this is almost a royal we here, that Fischer Bossert has dedicated himself to the one, or I would argue the most under-researched area of Greek numismatics, early electrum coinage of the 7th and 6th century. In this area, he has undertaken dice studies Recording in progress. of some big coinages, many fiendishly difficult. And here I mentioned, for example, the so-called Fane series or the now newly attributed Heraclea coinage, as well as a range of other coinages. His research shows that the arduous process of first collecting and then scrutinizing hundreds of electron coins, often made with multiple reverse punches, pays off. Research in the field of early coinage is beginning to alter our understanding of the archaic economy as a whole, and here Fischer Bossert plays a key role in illuminating a broader picture. 
when the Huntington Committee and its late much beloved chairman, Professor Jerry Bakarak, looked at the field of candidates in the field of Greek coinage, Wolfgang fischer botzert stood out. His long-term important publication of research in the field of archaic, classical, and Hellenistic coinage will stand the test of time, just as those of other winners of the Huntington Medal. For his personal commitment and extraordinary achievement in the field of numismatics, I'm very proud to award him, award him now the Archer M. Huntington Medal. And before handing it over to him, um, I think the picture earlier has gone, I'd like to also mention that he is the first recipient of our new design undertaken um, by our soldiers winner, Eugene Dorp, and thank you to Peter von Alphen for organizing this, the old medal um, at Lyft, so I've so first one. Please welcome. Dear ladies and gentlemen, in recent years, we have witnessed several large-scale refugee flows in both the old and the new worlds. According to statistics of the European Union, there were more than 30 million refugees worldwide last year, and more than 50 million internally displaced persons due to conflict and violence. The gravity of the problem might obscure the fact that the phenomenon is by no means new. To draw just one obvious comparison, towards the end of the Second World War, the Allies expected more than 11 million refugees in Central Europe alone. Flight and expulsion are constant themes of human history. It is therefore not surprising that even such an exotic discipline as ours can contribute something to this topic. When talking about ancient Greek exile coinages today, it is admittedly not about illuminating or even solving a human tragedy. It is first and foremost a purely numismatic problem. Nevertheless, the topic allows some insights. It will turn out that we are more or less unable to prove refugee flows numismatically. What we can discover are individual coinages of displaced persons, mostly of a few rich and powerful people. That is what comes of following the money trail. For an archaeologist, and I am one, these insights are not new. There is little that is as frustrating as trying to prove a historically documented migration by seeking archaeological evidence. Let us put it to the test. In the early 60s, there was an unusual supply of Sicilian bronze coins on the numismatic market at Athens. On the basis of this material, Peter Robert Franke reconstructed a hoard that was allegedly found near Chalkis on the island of Euboea. Relying on the then chronology, he dated the hoard to 420 for 15 BC and drew the conclusion that these Sicilian coins had been brought to the east by refugees from Leontinoi. A few years earlier, in 422, Syracuse had forced its neighbor Leontinoi to accept a simpolity, that is to say, the polis Leontinoi ceased to exist. In this situation, citizens of Leontinoi might have taken refuge in the mother city of Leontinoi in Chalkis. So far, so good. Franke's suggestion was widely accepted, and the Chalkis horde is cited as an interesting freak, so to say, until today. However, soon after Franke's article was published, it turned out that the fine spot was situated farther west, probably near Megara. Secondly, the underlying chronology changed. Today it is agreed that the Syracusan part of the court has to be dated to the last decade of the 5th century. Therefore the hoard moves to a period when a citizen of Leontinoi had more reason to return to his home city than to flee from it. In 405, 
the polis leontinoi was re-established even if for a short time. Thus, Francus Hort might tell us a, a story about a Greek merchant or seaman who realized that he still had bronze coins in his pocket that were worth nothing in his home area, and so he got rid of them. When thinking of exiled people in Greek history, names of expelled tyrants and ostracized politicians come to mind. Just one famous example on the left side. Uh, well, after having been expelled from Athens in 510, the former tyrant Hippias tried uh, in vain for 20 years to return and regain his old position. During this period, he issued coins in one of his places of re refuge in Asia Minor, either Sigeon or Lampsakos. All we have of this coinage are two obols struck from the same pair of dies, which differ from contemporary Athenian obols by nothing but the legend, Hip, Hippiu, instead of Athe Athenaion, and the symbol next to the owl. Yeah. Uh, an ear of grain rather than the olive twig. As inconspicuous as these coins are, they are interesting. Whether or not they prove that the Athenian old coinage was introduced by Hippias himself, these coins show that the former tyrant used Athenian imagery to make his claims known. This is in contrast uh, to the coinage Themistocles issued in Magnesia after having been ostracized. There is no Athenian symbolism whatsoever. But perhaps one should not speak of an exile coinage here. Themistocles had become a local ruler under Persian supremacy, and his son followed him to the throne of Magnesia. While it is, of course, just about terms, I would prefer calling this a dynastic coinage. Turning from individuals to refugee groups, one famous example should be discussed, although it is not entirely clear whether it has led to an exile coinage. In the early 4th century, one of the Siglets, the island of Sifnos, went through an intestine strife, what the Greeks called a stasis. The polity was divided into parties that are usually called oligarchs and democrats. The situation was already tense in 394 when the sea battle of Knidos swept away Spartan rule from the Aegean. Sifnian nobles who had relied upon Spartan support became nervous and some of them brought their assets into safety on the island of Paros. Two years later, the internal crisis was brought to a head. The Sifnian aristocrats were expelled by the party of Democrats. The refugees turned to Melos first and to Aegina and Troitsen afterwards. Obviously, these people were not destitute. After forming a government in exile, they published a resolution, the so-called Sefisma, and hired mercenaries to retake their possessions. In the end, their adventure failed. We do not know what became of them. What we do know, after all, is a unique specimen from a Sifnian gold coinage that fits the date. Jonathan Kagan, here in the room, has recently considered whether this gold coin might have been, I quote, struck from metal seized from the expelled oligarchs. It is equally possible that it is about an issue of the exiles thought to pay mercenaries. Neither version can be proven, unfortunately. The history of the Sifnian Stasis tells us that exile groups were subjects of international law then as today, even if the concept of international law is an anachronism in antiquity. There is much evidence, however, that exile groups were regarded as independent polities. 
For instance, a group of exiles from the island of Zakynthos were allowed to join the Second Attic League. Another revealing example is provided by the treaty concluded by Athens and Clazomenae in 387. At that time, Clazomenae was in a state of stasis, and the treaty refers to this. The Clazomenian nobles had retreated to a stronghold nearby, and there was open war. In making the treaty with the Clazomenians who had remained in the city, Athens assured that it would not take sides. Athenian neutrality in this affair is also expressed in the re relevant documentary relief up there. On the left side, there's a fat tailed ram, a symbol well known from contemporary Glasomenian coinage. The right side is broken off, but hooves of a second sheep are still preserved, most probably a second ram symbolizing the opposite party. The Athenians thus made it known that they would continue to count on both parties in the future. An exile coinage that has received little attention was issued by exiled Tyrinthians. Tyrins is well known for its Mycenaean castle, but it was still a Greek polis in historical times. Tyrinthians fought in the Persian Wars, so their ethnic appears inter alia in the inscription of the serpent column originally erected in Delphi. You can visit the remnants of this column on the Istanbul at Medan till today. Right after the end of the Persian Wars, a bad fate befell the Tyrinthians. Argos, the most powerful polity within the Argolid, tried to force all surrounding polis into a synarchism similar to what Syracuse later did with Leontinoi. Therefore, a large body of the Tyrinthians took refuge at Haliais, a polis situated in the Hermionis, which is, geographically speaking, part of the Argolid, but a separate landscape dominated by the city Hermione. The ancient historians do not tell anything more about Tyrins and the Tyrinthians. The numismatist Yanis Svoronos, however, established that there is a Tyrinthian coinage which is clearly later than the displacement just mentioned. He differentiated various bronze issues spread over the 4th century BC. They bear the Tyrinthian ethnic, often abbreviated, but also in full. For instance, this one, Tyrinthion. Furthermore, he attributed two unepigraphic silver issues to the Tyrinthians, these two ones. In so doing, Svoronos was certainly wrong. One of the two silver issues was reattributed re to Sparta long ago, based on local finds. For the other one, Sophia Cremidi now suggests Argos as the place of minting. If this holds true, the Tyrinthian coinage consists of bronze issues only. This would raise the question how a fiduciary coinage in foreign territory came into being. And above all, was Voronos right in that Haliais was the place of minting? Fortunately, the, the site of ancient Haliais has been excavated by the University of Pennsylvania over many years. It was proven that Haliais had been inhabited since the 8th century BC. Therefore, it was not a new foundation to receive the Tyrinthian exiles. This is important because a coinage in the name of Haliais does not exist. Possibly the polis Haliais was a dependency of Hermione and acknowledged Hermionic coins as legal tender. 
Nevertheless, Halliers was independent enough to conclude a treaty with Athens in 424. The situation is somewhat mysterious. It is all the more interesting that Svoronos was right in localizing the Tyrrhentian mint at Halliers. This mint has been established during the excavations. Furthermore, no less than 131 specimens of the Tyrrhentian issues have been found at Halliers, 15 of which within the building of the mint. Considering the fact that the Tyrrhentian coinage extends for almost a century, there is no doubt that the Tyrrhentian community had been granted the right to issue these coins in its name, a right which the polis Halliers itself did not claim or was not allowed to claim. In order to judge all this correctly, one must keep in mind that a purely fiduciary coinage is unlikely to have existed as early as the 4th century BC. Any bronze coinage of this period needed to be covered by precious metal coins for enabling the buyer to exchange these coins into coins of intrinsic value. Transactions of this kind had to be legal at the local market. Or, to look at it from the other side, a bronze coinage that was imposed on a local market by market law is accepted only when it is possible to buy precious metal coins with bronze coins, minus Ajo, of course. So this is not a parasitic coinage. From my point of view, there must have been some kind of agreement between the Tyrrhentians and the city of Hermione. Otherwise, the Tyrrhentian coinage would not have lasted for about a century, at the latest until the destruction of Halliers at the beginning of the 3rd century BC. There is no, not the time to discuss all the presumed Greek exile coinages here. To shorten the matter, allow me to name the examples I can acknowledge as such and draw some simple conclusions before turning to a hitherto unknown coinage of this kind. Generally speaking, there are two kinds of Greek exile coinages. First, there are long-term coinages consisting of small denominations. The poor appearance mirrors the fact that the relevant refugee communities had to persevere over long time spans without territory and therefore adapt to poor conditions. Besides the Tyrrhentian coinage, there is the coinage of Sybaris in southern Italy, as far it was struck abroad after the destruction of the city in 510 BC. It consists of small change coins only. During the short-term reoccupations of their city, the Sybarites issued drums as well, but no status. Second, there are short-term coinages consisting of large denominations. Coinages of this kind are likely to have been intended for equipping the refugees and paying mercenaries. These issues were financed either by assets the refugees had rescued during their escape or by subsidies granted by foreign supporters. Besides the unique gold coin of the Sifnians, there are two, perhaps three, 5th century exile coinages. Of course, none of them is without problems. First, the unique tetragram and six litrae minted by exiled Zankleans, presumably the 300 nobles spared by the Samians who had conquered Zankle in 494. Based on style and metrology, the issue can be dated to the 460s, that is, many years after Zankle had been renamed Messana. According to Giacomo Manganaro, the place of minting might have been Mulai, today Milazzo, a dependency of Zankle Messana. Second, three 
tetradrams struck according to the Samian standard and with Samian types, but without Samian ethnic. Falling into two dike combinations, this small issue appears to have been produced by those Samians who had retreated to the Samian Perea after the failed Samian revolt in 439. With Persian support, they persevered until 405, when the Spartan commander Lysander re-established them as ruling class of Samos. Third, according to Christoph Böhringer, the last tetradram issue of Leontinoi is likely to be later than the fourth Sinoikism in 422. If so, these tetradrams must have been produced somewhere else by rebels who wished <clears throat> for counteraction against Syracuse. However, this file cannot be closed yet. The latest Greek exile coinage that I know was produced by Athenian refugees during the years when Athens had taken sides with Mithridates VI of Pontus. Of course, this one here. The exact place of minting is not clear, but I think it is not the Roman camp of Zula, but somewhere else, Eubea perhaps, where a hoard containing a few specimens has been found. Interestingly, the relevant coins do not bear magistrates' names, but just the re revolutionary slogan, Hodemos, the people. In total, there are seven, perhaps just five, Greek exile coinages known. Now I would like to add another one. This unique coin has puzzled the numismatic audience since 2007, when it was published for the first time. According to its weight, it is a tetradrum struck according to the Attic standard. On the obverse is a facing head of a bearded man with horns. One and the second one. And animal ears, most probably a river god. The reverse is triple struck. There are two grains flanked by the abbreviated ethnic Zura, all within a square in cues. It became known by hearsay that the coin had to be heavily cleaned before publication, and there were rumors that the ethnic had to be reconstructed by the cleaner. And so there was a debate whether he might have failed in doing so. I will come back to this point later. Images of the coin in unclean condition reveal that the first letter of the ethnic was covered by a thick incrustation indeed. But there is something else that I would like to bring to your attention. This coin was not part of an encrusted cluster of coins as known from many hordes. It came onto the desk as a single coin. It is true, it came with other coins which might have shaped the view of those who published the novelty. However, the late Silvia Hurte, who once examined the whole sample of coins, um, sample told me it was not clear at all whether the sample of coins represented a hoard, maybe just a parcel of a larger hoard, or rather a sample of stray finds. This information is important because it overrules the hearsay that the coin was derived from a late archaic hoard. When taking the ethnic Zura at face value, one cannot help but attribute the tetram to Syracuse. Thus the coin was inserted in the sequence once established by Erich Böhringer. At first glance, there is a spot that meets all the needs indeed. The transition from Böhringer's first group to the second. The coins of, of group one have a windmill in cues with a tiny head of Aretusa inserted in the center. The square in cues is gone with the second group 
and is replaced by a round die with the image of Aretusa's head surrounded by dolphins. Hence, the new tetradram seemingly makes a missing link, still with square and cues, but already with a figural reverse, reverse image. The abbreviated ethnic was said to match the tradition of the first group too, while the four barred sigma already fits the second group. You see, it's a four barred sigma, just as with the second group. In fact, the letter forms are not that unequivocal. The distinct features of the last letter alpha cannot be observed here. The authors of the publication suggested that the alpha was likely to have a slightly slanted horizontal bar, which would point to an early date. It will turn out in a moment that this was an error. I am not going to discuss the interpretation of the coin that was then suggested. It be the first issue of Gilon struck in 485 after he had set himself up as tyrant of Syracuse. I do, do not need to because I am not convinced that this coin must be dated that early. Instead, I want to draw your attention to the fabric of the coin. Deep in Cusa are not at all common in the Greek West. The reverse sides of Beringer's group one are quite shallow, and the somewhat deeper in Cusa of Selenus and Himera are fairly small and surrounded by a beveled surface. The new coin is quite different. When looking for a matching fabric, coins from a completely different region come to mind. Northern Greece, Athens, Corinth. Here, here we come across large square incused dies which are struck deeply into the flan. Another technical feature that does not fit the place of minting at Syracuse is the flan itself. Sicilian flans have a well-known peculiarity, two protrusions along the edge at opposite sides, these ones and here as well. These knobs are the result of the Sicilian tradition of manufacturing blanks. As a rule, coins struck on Sicilian blanks are almost circular. It would go too far to explain this in more detail. In short, the new coin with its angular flan and without any knobs along the edge does not show any char characteristics of Sicilian fabric. This becomes clear once more when glancing over the relevant plate of the Historia Numorum Sicily, which is in preparation. I am very indebted to the editors for allowing me to show you this plate, which is of course work in progress. When comparing the new coin with the sequence, the new coin is here, with uh, this sequence of early Syracusan coin types, one cannot help but observe that the new coin makes a foreign body. Fortunately, there is new evidence about this issue. Curiously enough, this evidence is provided by a man who has spent many years in exile himself, Joachim Lelevel, a Polish numismatist of the 19th century. In 1854, a book featuring a body of his drawings was published, the Album d'un Graveur Polonais. According to historical circumstances, the drawings must have been made before Lelevel left Poland in or after the Polish November uprising in 1830. Lelevel was, highly, was a highly gifted drawer with a proclivity for cartography. Furthermore, he was a knowledgeable numismatist even in his early years. In later years, he would contribute mostly to the fields of Celtic, medieval, and oriental coinages. Among the plates of the album, there is one devoted to Greek coins. In the center, we come across 
another specimen of the mysterious Syracusan issue. This coin was drawn in or before 1830 at the latest. Its current whereabouts are not known to me. It is quite possible that the coin belonged to a Polish collection that was dispersed in later times or confiscated by Russian authorities after the Polish revolt had been crushed. If Lelevel himself possessed an important collection, he had to leave it behind when fleeing to France. In any case, the coin in question was not among the few coins from Lelevel's legacy, which were sold in auction in 1894. Lelevel's drawing is of good use to us, nevertheless. It confirms the characteristics of the coin published in 2007 as outlined. The flan is angular and without the Sicilian protrusions, the reverse die was struck deeply into the blank. And above all, the drawing clears up the shape of the alpha. This letter has a horizontal bar, not a slanted one. This is not the archaic, but the classical form. Also, both existence and shape of the sigma are now confirmed, giving the cleaner of the second coin an excellent report. Considering the letter forms of the ethnic Zura, you have now much more leeway for dating the coin. The upper limit is Beringer's Group 1, which terminates around 485 BC. The lower limit is provided by the Y, which was to change the form during the 430s. Now, how shall we proceed to date the two coins? There is no archaeological context, no die link, merely letter forms. Hence, we have to rely upon a method that has gone somewhat out of fashion, the analysis of the style. Don't worry, I'm not going to bother you with acquaintances of the relevant German tradition. Just a little bit. If these coins were produced in the 480s, we should expect them to show a feature that is peculiar to all archaic human heads, no matter whether on coins, in vase painting or in sculpture the hair varying according to position. Let us have a look at the head of the Nike donated by Akermos, a marble sculpture from the first half of the sixth century. Above the forehead, the hair is arranged in swinging waves. At the back of the head, the hair forms slightly quivering lines and the long strands falling down here, falling down from the head, are formed like, like strings of knots. The same characteristics can be observed with the head of, a, of the statue of Dionysos from Ikaria. Above the forehead, the locks are arranged to snail-shaped structures, the so-called buckelocken. The upper head and the moustache show thin quivering lines, and the beard is arranged in small, regular notches. This pleasure in variation is a common feature in archaic Greek art. With the transition to classical art, this feature goes entirely lost. For instance, the kentaur from the west pediment of the Temple of Zeus at Olympia has thin, long strings of hair waving down all around the face in the same way. Classical sculpture has a new sense for unity and interior logic of sculptural forms. All details are treated and handled uniformly. When inserting the Syracusan tetradrum for comparison, it becomes clear that the facing head of the river god has much more in common with the kentaur from Olympia than with the facing head of Dionysus on a late archaic coin. The Dionysus has a head, has hair which is variously shaped, snail locks around the forehead, corkscrew locks falling down beneath the ears, and the beard consists of straight strings. 
The usual way of dating an object by style is inserting it in a sequence of the internal chronology of which is fairly firm. With facing heads on coins, this is not possible. They are only of very few, and their absolute dates are often guesswork rather than firm ground. To pick just one example, a fraction of the south Italian city of Laos that features the facing head of a river god is dated to circa 460 BC in recent literature. My stomach tells me this is about one generation too early but for the time being, there is no way of proving one date or another. So let us rather return to the sculptures. The Kentaur from Olympia has brought us down to the 460s. This is confirmed by the comparison with the portrait of blind Homer that may be dated to circa 460 BC. When taking in account the statue of Zeus from Cape Artemision from the middle of the 5th century, it becomes clear this, that the Syracusan coin goes somewhat beyond the blind Homer indeed. The details of the hair are becoming less and less ornamental. The growing naturalness is caused by random squirrels and gems. In this respect, the head of Zeus is slightly more progressive than the Syracusan coin, which may therefore be dated circa 450 BC. By redating this coin issue, we have arrived in quite, diff quite a different political conditions. In the middle of the fifth century, Syracuse was not ruled by a tyrant, but governed by a democracy. According to its peculiar fabric, the coin was not minted in Sicily, not to mention Syracuse. Where then? The alleged fine spot in Calabria might lead to a point of origin farther east. Despite the non-Sicilian origin, the Attic weight standard would easily fit to Sicilian coinage. Hence, the question is raised whether these coins were minted for an invasion from outside into Sicily, or rather for an area of circulation where the Attic weight standard was valid too. If you agree with me so far, the most important question is, who is it who produced these coins in the name of Syracuse, but somewhere else? Well. Even democratic regimes produce their exiles. In fact, there are various names which may be taken into consideration. A man named Tindaridas tried to rise to become the tyrant of Syracuse. He and his partisans were expelled from the city. And in reaction to this experience, the Petalismos, a local version of ostracism, was introduced in Syracuse in 454-453 BC. The Syracusan admiral Phaelos was banished after a high-handed raid on the island of Elba in 453 BC. And the prince of the Sicils, Ducetius, was sent into exile, along with an appanage, to Corinth by the Syracusans in 451 BC. The last one, Ducetius, is the least likely to have produced a coinage in the name of Syracuse. The first two ones, Tindaridas and Phaelos, might have tried to manage their return one way or another. Glancing over the map, here's Sicily, here's Syracuse, the alleged fine spot of the coin is here. We can only speculate where these exiles might have retreated. However, the fabric and the weight standard of the coin in question give us some clues. Both historically and numismatically speaking, Corinth is the most likely place of minting. Corinth is the mother city of Syracuse, 
and the Corinthians would therefore cared about Syracusan exiles and the reasons of their banishment. Secondly, the fabric of the Syracusan exile coin may well be Corinthian. Last but not least, the Corinthian weight standard fits perfectly in the Attic weight standard of Syracuse. The Corinthian stator has half the weight of the Syracusan tetradrum. The two grains of corn on the reverse might go as markers of the denominations, which would be a Corinthian distater. For the other option, Elis in the Peloponnese, there are ideological rather than numismatic clues. The fabric is close to the Corinthian, but the weight standard is agenetic and does not easily fit in the Attic standard of the Syracusan coin. What matches, however, is the mythology. I've already said that the facing head on the obverse can be interpreted as that of a river god. In Syracusan mythology, the river of Alpheos, which runs through the western Peloponnese, this one, touching Olympia, is the most important one. The story is well known that he fell in love with the nymph Aretusa, which fled from him to Syracuse. Since Aretusa is featured on all Syracusan tetradrums of this period, this connection would make perfect sense. Just to give you an idea of the location, this is the island Ortigia, the old center of Syracuse. To the left, there's the old harbor. And to the right, there's the Mediterranean Sea. The sweet water spring, Aretusa, is about here. The fact that the sweet water spring is situated very close to the salt water of the harbor has inspired the mythology, um, mythology just mentioned. However, the original story of Arethusa and Alpheus, as we know it from a few fragments of archaic poetry, is no love story, such as a version, a version that later writers provide. Rather, it is about the story of a bride kidnapping and probably even a rape. Such stories are well known from Greek mythology. The most famous is a story about the god Hades kidnapping Persephone, the daughter of the goddess Demeter. Persephone became Hades' wife and was, uh, was thus forced to spend half the year with him in the underworld. That is why we have winter seasons. When considering the version of the Syracusan mythology, the emergence of the river god Alpheus on a coin of Syracusan exiles makes perfect sense. Alpheus is the male god that Aretusa was so afraid of that she fled from him. The unusual appearance of the river god, a facing head instead of a profile, can be interpreted as a threat, a threat towards Arethusa, who represents the Syracusan polis. From this point of view, this would be the first exile coinage with a political message. In a way, this message is more blunt than the Athenian slogan, Hodemos. Returning to where we started, it has turned out that the numismatic record does not easily provide evidence for the countless nameless people who fled to foreign lands from violence. What we have are coin issues of big men in exile who had managed to secure assets for financing their return one way or another. Such big men are also known from recent history. There is some irony in that it is an impoverished man in exile, the Polish numismatist Joachim Lelevel, who provides us the clue for putting the Syracusan exile coinage at its proper place. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, uh, thank you, Wolfgang. Um, so I think that's very convincing. Um, uh, I just would note a couple things. One, you know, Corinth, 20 years later, is the place where they're striking coins for their colonies. Uh, as, and so that there is at least a later tradition of them striking coins for other, for other cities. And the other thing I'd, I'd mention is, or rather question is, why wouldn't you consider the Samians at Zanclay an exile coinage? Just because they were well armed doesn't make them not exiles. Uh, <clears throat> this is just um, a game of terms, of course. Uh, because these Samians were not to return, but they, were, uh, they wanted to, to found an apoikia in foreign lands. So uh, there are refugee coinages, but this is not an exile coinage, how I would, would uh, uh, coin the term. It's really a, a wonderful talk that um, very much plays to your strengths, I have to say, between the stylistic analysis, historical analysis, and, and, uh, and, uh, and numismatic analysis, of course. Um, just one quick question. I mean, the, the facing head of Alphaeus, if this interpretation is correct, is really a, an exceptional um, port portrayal. Um, obviously, a very skilled uh, engraver you know, was um, employed to, to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, roughly some generation or two later, you have in Syracuse and Dionysius, the tyrant there, some exceptional um, three-quarter facing um, portrayals of Arthusa. Um, the question is, I mean, it, it's obviously a bit of a stretch, but you know, would you think that what happens a little bit later would then be sort of a counterpoint to this Alphaeus, or would it could have already been too far in the past at that point? <clears throat> Probably not, because these facing heads, which uh, start to emerge in the last decade of the fifth century, are somewhat like a fashion. You know, uh, the uh, coinage of, of Rhodes after uh, the Sinaichism uh, of 408 starts uh, with, a, with the facing head of Helios. And also there are some uh, North Greek coinages, Ainos and so on, which start uh, facing heads at about the same time when uh, after after changing the weight standards. So this is something entirely new, but it has become a fashion. Uh, th this fashion can also be observed in waste painting at exactly the same time. So I think there is no connection. Fair enough. Um, just one other thing. Um, I'm sure you know that in September of last year, before the INC meeting in Krakow, there was a small conference on level well and uh, i've been present <laughs> right yeah they got the idea to to put this in the proceedings right. but i did not uh, take part in the in the conference but well um there, there was a great exhibit um at the nearby museum with many of the plates mm -hmm. that low well had engraved himself including the very plate for that um that right. image. Um, so I've, I've got pictures of both the plate and Me too. the print as well. So <laughs> Me it's, too. It's really amazing actually to see that. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. astounding. So thank you. And by the way, the, the, this album is a very rare book. Yeah. So uh, as far as I know, the ANS doesn't have a copy. Uh, nor does the uh, Paris Bibliothèque Nationale or the Vienna uh, uh, National Library have one. Uh, London has one, Berlin has one, Brussels has one. So this is extremely rare and not known to numismatists before. There are no further questions or comments. Um, I'm sure you've all seen how um, you know how wonderful. Wolfgang well, can put these things together with the constraints and uh, you know again many congratulations um, for you thank all. you and thank you all for coming and those online as well for listening.
And um, I think we now have some more questions um, for those of you who are here in the room. So thank you very much again, Rolf. Thank you.